So the book of Revelation is, in summary, about the triumph of God's kingdom. It's the triumph of God's kingdom. And triumph over what? Over Satan's kingdom. The defeat of Satan and his kingdom. What is Satan's kingdom? It's nothing other than the creation of God where he has usurped the rule of God. And how did he do it? He did it with the willing support of Adam from whom we're all descended. That's how he did it in the garden from the fall. He, Adam, who was God's viceroy in the kingdom that he created, handed over, completely handed over, made terms of peace with Satan and handed over his whole race to Satan's rule. But the book of Revelation is telling us that God is going to restore his rightful rule and it will be unchallenged. He rules now. But there's a challenge to it all the time in the, in the person of Satan and all of his demonic forces. But God is going to be triumphant and all of that opposition is going to be put down. God's kingdom, God's rule will be restored over all created order. And in the book of Revelation, let me remind you, because we're, we're over halfway through now, but it's very easy to lose sight of where you've been. So I'm not going to be long, but just give, let me just give you a, a quick reminder. This is revealed in seven visions. Seven is God's number of perfection, of completeness. Divine completeness, divine com perfection. And so he gives us seven pictures. Do you remember, he writes to seven churches. It's his number, again and again, of perfection. In the first three chapters, we see the first vision. And that's a vision of Christ in the midst of his churches. That even though Satan's rule goes on and on... Yet Christ has his churches. And all the time, though the world doesn't acknowledge it, Christ is ruling in the midst of his churches. In the second vision, that's in chapters 4 to 7. We see Christ opening and implementing. That's what it means for him to open. It's He implements the first six seals of the seven-sealed book. What's the seven-sealed book? It's God's restoration plan. It's the plan by which God is going to restore the kingdom to himself and defeat Satan. It's that plan. It's the plan for how that prayer is answered. Thy kingdom come. That's what that book is. And in the second vision, we see the first six of the seven seals opened. And you know what they are. Let me remind you, basically, they're God frustrating Satan's intentions they frust by, by preaching the gospel. By bringing war, by bringing socio-economic strife, by bringing death. And we see it all, all around us, all the time. That, that's what God does. Then we come to the third seal, uh, the, the third vision, chapters 8 to 11. And that's about the opening of the seventh seal, which is opened as seven trumpets. Seven trumpets blow in the seventh seal. Of which the last three are woes. The first four are those which basically say the world is being made a bit harder and harder place to support human life. And, and the last three are woes. But it ends up with this, as all the visions do. It ends up with, chapter 11, verse 15. The kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he, Christ, shall reign forever and ever. And then, a couple of weeks ago, we came to the fourth vision, which is in chapters 12 to 14. And that's all about the conflict between Christ and Antichrist. When does it start? From the fall in the Garden of Eden. That's when it starts. The fall in the Garden of Eden. When does it end? When God winds up this whole creation. Right to the end. There are three more visions to come in chapters 15 to 22, which we'll see as the weeks <clears throat> unfold, God willing. But each vision shows us the conflict between Satan and God throughout created time, right up to the end of all things, each with different perspectives. Each vision has different aspects. Each one gives increasing detail of the end of all things. The further we go, in the visions, the more detail we get about what the end will be like. And what's the purpose of these visions? The purpose is this, four things. First of all, comfort to God's believing people. 
When Paul writes to the Thessalonians about how the end will come, he says to them, comfort one another with these words. It's comfort to God's people. That's why he tells us these things. It's comfort. You look around and the state of things is just such a confusion. But to God's people, we have this word. And it's such a comfort to God's people. Because the second point is that it gives assurance that however chaotic things appear, they're all under the control of our God. Nothing is out of the control of our God. And they're an encouragement. Thirdly, an encouragement. The purpose of them. It's an encouragement to God's people to wait patiently. We need to wait. It seems such a long time. But it's a time and times and half a time. And he'll cut it short. The end is coming. Wait patiently for glory. And then fourthly, there's another purpose in all of this. Now listen. Listen. There's another purpose. The purpose is a warning. It's a warning to take heed. To take, just as John the Baptist said to the Pharisees who came out to him, he said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? This book is telling us that there is an end that is coming. And it's a day of wrath. And it sounds like, oh, oh, oh gosh, here's, here's somebody in these, in the 21st century, somebody who is so um, living in the dark ages that he's preaching fire and brimstone and hell and yes, I am. And why am I? Because this book says it clearly. And it's a warning. Take heed of the warning. If I'm telling you, don't go down that road because there's a great big traffic jam down there. And you go down there and you find there's a great big traffic jam. You'll think, gosh, I wish I'd listened to him. Well, I tell you, this isn't a traffic jam. This is the end of all things. This is the judgment on all who reject Christ and his rule. So today, what I plan to do is to finish looking at this fourth vision, which runs up to the end of chapter 14. Let me just remind you what this fourth vision is about. Chapter 12 is about Satan's defeat that is sealed by Christ, the child that comes of the woman. And he thinks he's victorious, but he's actually defeated. And he's furious, and he makes war with the church. Chapter 13 of the vision is Satan's vile kingdom of Antichrist. What do I mean by that? I mean this world, this godless world all around us, with its politics, with its economics, with its philosophy, with its science, as Paul says, falsely so called. With its morality, which is turned on its head compared with God's morality. Its values, which are completely anti-Christian values. With its religion, which is anti-Christian religion, whatever it might call itself. And we see at the end of chapter 13, the certain failure of the kingdom of Antichrist. Why? Because the number of the beast is the same as the number of man. What is it? Six, six. Six. Let me put it another way. Not seven, not seven, not seven. Falling short, falling short, falling short. It's failure. Then in chapter 14, we see the serene rule of the Lamb. <coughs> this is Christ. Isn't it, isn't it amazing? You know, the, the one who is the king of the universe, the one who is crowned king of the universe, so often appears as a Lamb. When John the Baptist saw him coming as the man, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, coming to him to be baptised, John the Baptist said to his disciples, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold, Look at the Lamb of God. Here he comes. What is he? A conquering hero. He's a lamb because he accomplishes his purposes. You know, when the, when the book, John could see no one that was fitted to open the book. I, could, I wept much because I found no one. Don't weep, says the elder to him. Look, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. That, that great proud beast, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And I looked and what did he see? A lamb, as it had been slain. A lamb. Because he accomplishes his purposes in the role of a lamb who is a sacrifice for sin. For the soul that sins, it shall die. How then shall the law be satisfied for people who must be taken to heaven only in the death of a fitting substitute? 
And so he's a lamb. He's a sacrifice. Pictured in all those Old Testament lambs. And so now as the Passover lamb was sacrificed as a picture for them in the Old Testament, the New Testament says Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And with him, this lamb, in this world, at the same time as Antichrist goes on, there he is and he's got his 144,000. What's that? The people of God in every age upon the earth. And they're all there. And what's it telling us? Not one of them is lost. Every single one. Now, we're going to look at the second half of chapter 14. And the key point of it is this. And this is such an important message to hear. This is the key point. The things that we see do not go on and on. There is an end. There is an end that is decreed by God. There is an end which will bring judgment and an end of things as we know them. And in that end, there will be glory for the elect of God. There will be glory for the people of God. There will be glory for the ones whom Christ redeemed with his own precious blood at the cross of Calvary. And for everybody else, for every rebel, for every citizen of this kingdom of Antichrist in this world, there will be hell and it will be dreadful. And I can't describe it other than in the words of Scripture. And Scripture produces the most serious words it can to describe an eternity without any influence of the presence of God and of his good. And the whole world, whilst we say this, if you believe it, and you truly believe it, and the whole world sticks its fingers in its ears and goes, la, 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 don't want to hear what you're saying. But it doesn't stop it from being true. Oh, what a dreadful thing. The end is announced. We saw it briefly last week in verses 6 to 11. Three angels. Verses 6 to 11. Three angels come. And they issue a call. Firstly, a call for every knee to bow to Christ. That's basically what it's saying. Give glory, fear God and give glory to him. It's a call, as the scriptures said, every knee shall bow to Christ. It's a call for every knee to bow. Secondly, the fall of Babylon is pronounced. What is Babylon? In the book of Revelation, Babylon clearly is false religion. It's the religion of Antichrist. It's that false religion, that Christless religion. That religion of this world, whatever it might be, whether it be Islam or Buddhism or whatever it might be, whether it be just Western materialism without God, it promises a heaven of sorts without God's justice. Just mull those words over. All false religion promises a heaven without the justice of God. The true gospel promises heaven on the basis of of the true of the justice of God because what does it say about our God that he is a just God and a savior because he's a savior doesn't mean he stopped being a just God he's a just God and a savior that he might as Romans says be just and the justifier of those whose faith is in Christ Jesus he remains just. He doesn't violate his justice when he saves sinners. Why not? Because Christ died and answered that demand of the law that the soul that sins, it shall die. No, Babylon is fallen. And then thirdly, the certain reality of hell is announced. And it's, there's chilling words. Verses 9, 10 and 11. They're chilling words. Hell is announced. The end is coming. Satan's kingdom is surely defeated. All rebellion will certainly receive its just reward. But what about God's saints? What about God's set-apart ones? What about his people? In verses 12 to 14, we read about them. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labours, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat, like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And I'll read verse 15 as well. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle. 
and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. The first vision of the book of Revelation in chapters 1 to 3 promises eternal blessings to God's people. you read it again and again in the letters to the churches. To him that overcomes. To those that overcome. To those who remain faithful in the face of worldly antichrist opposition. It promises eternal blessings. Eternal blessings. The second vision pictures an innumerable multitude of God's people. In eternal bliss, I looked and round the throne was a multitude that no man can number. The third vision pictures judgment on the nations, on Satan's kingdom, and reward for God's servants and prophets. And this fourth vision pictures the end as a two-stage harvest, the wheat and the grapes. A two-stage harvest. I've called this message the harvest of the world. In verse 12... Down to verse 16, we see the wheat harvest. The wheat harvest. Who is pictured by the wheat harvest? Who is, who is it picturing? Well, in verse 12, they're called saints. Saints means set apart ones. Set apart how? In the sovereign purposes of God before time. Chosen in him. Chosen in Christ, says Ephesians 1 verse 4, before the foundation of the world. When were they chosen? Jesus said to his disciples, you didn't choose me, I chose you. When? Before the foundation of the world. Where are their names written? In the Lamb's book of life. When? Before the foundation of the world. When did he give us all the blessings of salvation? Before the world began, before time began. This is the sovereign grace of God. Names written in the Lamb's book of life. Elect. Why? What was the motive? What was the reason for it? The grace of God. Oh, that's not fair. It's irrelevant whether you think it's fair or not. It's by the grace of God. By the undeserved favour of God. Called into union with Christ from eternity. Called into his union. You know, like when a, a woman marries a man, at least this is the way it used to be before all of this last 20 or 30 years nonsense began to promulgate. The woman took the name of her husband, united with him, made one flesh together with him, treated as one in the eyes of the law and in every respect. So the people of God are put in union with Christ before the foundation of the world. Justified in the Lamb, as it says in chapter 13 and verse 8, they're all going to worship except those whose names are written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. What are they like when they're born? They, they're born with, with halos. They're perfect people, aren't they? No, they're not. They're born sinners like everyone else. As Ephesians 2 tells us, if you're a believer, it's not because you were any better than anybody else. You were a child of wrath, exactly like everybody else. Don't for one minute think that you're a believer because you were in any respect better than anybody else. You weren't. You weren't. Children of wrath, even as others, you weren't alive to God. You didn't have a God sense naturally in you. You didn't. You were dead in trespasses and sins. You were as dead as that valley of dry bones that Ezekiel saw. Bone dry dead. Very dry. Bone dry dead. But quickened. Made alive. By the Holy Spirit. Given eyes to see. Given faith to believe. By grace, so you say, through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And you live by faith. Look, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You live by faith. You live by the faith of Jesus. In Galatians 2, in verse 18, we read that we're justified. In other words, qualified, made holy. In the reckoning of the law and justice of God. Made holy by the faith of Jesus Christ. It then says a few verses further on. <clears throat> I am crucified with Christ. That's how united I am with him. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Who loved me. And gave himself for me. This is living by the faith of Jesus. As those 
justified by God. We believe the truth. As Paul says to the Thessalonians, he says, I'm bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of God, for God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, setting apart by the Spirit and belief of the truth. The, the evidence that I have, the marks that I see, are that you believe the truth of the gospel. And it says they keep the commandments of God. They keep the commandments of God. Is this, is this law works? Romans 3.31 says no. We establish the law by faith. The faith is not in contrast to the law. It's not that we're made right by our law works, by keeping God's commandments. No, not in that sense, but we keep the commandments of belief and trust in Christ. These are works of belief and trust that separate us from this world, that make us completely different in our thinking from this world. As Paul writes to the Philippians, Philippians 3 verse 20, for our conversation, or as the American Standard Version has it, and I think it's a good word, for our citizenship is in heaven. You know, you, you go abroad, but if you're British and you're born and bred here, you go abroad and wherever you are, you know my citizenship is in the country of my birth. That's where I'm from. That's the language I speak. This is what it's saying about the people of God. Our citizenship, our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 13, what does it say about these saints, these, these ones? This is the patience of the saints. They're waiting, they're waiting. This patience of the saints. And then verse 13, it says, I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. What does heaven say about them? It says they are blessed. If you're a child of God, if you're believing the Lord Jesus Christ, you are blessed. You're going to die one day as all will die. But if you die in the Lord, if you die believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you die with that faith of Jesus Christ, then you're blessed forevermore. Those who are in the Lord when they die, what does it mean from henceforth? Well, anybody who, any believer dying now, any believer dying at any time is immediately taken to be with the Lord. The, the, the thief on the cross, the penitent thief on the cross. This day, you know, Lord, remember me. This day you shall be with me in paradise. Blessed immediately. But I think there's a special meaning here in this from henceforth. From henceforth. From the announcement of the end of all things. That's what uh, John has just heard. The announcement of the end of all things. See, all are blessed who die in the Lord always, at all times. Any dying today in the Lord are blessed immediately. But this is from the announcement of the end. And this is finally blessed. This is, this is when all things are brought to complete fruition. With all the fullness of eternity and glory in the presence of God. And they rest. They may rest from their labours, saith the Spirit. And their works do follow them from the struggles and opposition of the kingdom of Antichrist, from the persecution of this world, from the separation from this world. It's, it's, it's hard work. It's hard work. Jesus said many times, don't, don't set out on it without counting the cost. There's a cost. It's hard work to go against the flow of this world. To go against, to walk the narrow way that leads to life and not be swept along in the broad way that leads to destruction. Their works, what are these works that follow them? Are we talking about progressive sanctification here? Is that what we're talking about? No, these are works of faith. The Pharisees said to Jesus, what must we do that we do the works of God? John 6, 28 and 29. And Jesus said, this is the work of God. And note he said it's God's work, actually, not ours. That you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the work of God. What must I do to do that? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not law works for rewards. Faith in Christ. We've already said, Romans 3.31, that by faith we establish the law. 
Of course it means that. Think of the par- The parables are not always the best place to derive definitive doctrine. But I think it's clear from the parable of the vineyard and the labourers. You know, some were employed first thing in the morning and others were employed when there was only an hour to go. And when they all came to get their wages, every one of them got exactly the same. Is that not telling us? It's not, it's not by works for reward that, that, that we're, we're, we're happy in heaven. It's not that because some's done more good works than others that they get bigger, bigger and better rewards. It doesn't mean that at all. But true faith works. That's what James tells us, isn't it? True faith works. Turn to Matthew. Matthew chapter 25. You don't have to. I'll read it out to you. Matthew 25, verse 31. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man, this is Jesus speaking, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Is he not talking about what we're reading in Revelation 14? Yes. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as the shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, then ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee, sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And then he will say to the others, Depart from me, I never knew you. But maybe in that way, their works do follow them. Their works do follow them. End of verse 13 of Revelation 14. Maybe in that way. They're not aware of it. They're not out for promotion because of it. But Jesus says, Your faith was true faith, and it worked. And when you did it to these, the least of my brethren, you did it unto me. Maybe in that way their works do follow them. So, verses 14 to 16, the elect of God, the wheat harvest, is taken out of this world before the end. He who reaps is Christ himself, the king sitting on the throne, on the cloud, it's, it's, it's a consistent picture through the book of Revelation. The Son of Man, that's the term that he used of himself in his earthly ministry more than any other term. And he's got a crown on his head and he's in his kingly role and he reaps the wheat harvest, the harvest of his people. He takes them out of this world. Is not the clear message here that the elect, the people of God, believers, are taken out of this world before the end? It echoes chapter 11, verses 12 and 13, when the the two witnesses were lying dead in the street, and after three and a half days the spirit of life entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon them that saw them. Then verse 12, and they heard a great voice from heaven, saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And And then things go on. The elect of God are taken out before the end. This is not some uh, silly notion of a secret rapture. This is the people of God. When the end is announced, the people of God are taken out, first of all. They're taken out of this world. Think about the other judgments that there have been that stand as warnings of judgment to come. The judgment of the flood in the days of Noah. Do you know that flood could not start until Noah and his believing family were taken out of the way? They were put in the ark. Do you know when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed and the angels were saying to Lot, we've got to get you out of here because if we don't get you out of here, we cannot rain down judgment on this place. They were taken out before the judgment came. 
and taken by Christ himself here. He's the one who reaps this harvest. He, he is the one with the sickle in his hand. He says elsewhere in scripture, behold, I am the children. He, he, he goes triumphantly into heaven with the people that he's reaped from this earth. In Psalm 24, uh, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be ye lift up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. That's when he came and died on the cross and rose again. But then when he comes for his people, it then repeats the thing. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. Here he is with his people. He's reaped his harvest of his elect out of this world. At the time decreed by the Father, when the harvest is ripe, when it's ripe, when the three and a half times is up, when the 1260 days is up, when the allotted time is up, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Will you be among those that Christ will take out of this world to glory? Will you? Will your treasure be in heaven or in Sodom? Look at Luke's Gospel, 17. Luke 17, verse 32. Luke 17, 32. He's talking about the end of all things. And in verse 32, Jesus says, Remember Lot's wife. You know what Lot's wife did? She came out of Sodom with Lot and their daughters. Came out of that situation. And what did she do? She looked back. Because where was her heart? Her heart was in Sodom. Everything she valued was in Sodom. And she was turned to a pillar of salt. She was turned to the same judgment that everybody in that place was turned to. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Is that not a picture of the people of God being taken out of this world before the end? So now, with the wheat harvest safely gathered in, verse 17. They're in heaven. The people of God are in heaven, in glory. And then verse 17. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And so it goes on. Another angel came and um, thrust in the sickle and reap. And they, they thrust in the sickle to gather the clusters of grapes from the earth. And put them into the winepress of the wrath of God. This is a picture of the final judgment. You know, as I said, the visions get more and more detailed as we go on. But this is all it says here. It's a picture of the final judgment. Clusters of the vine of the earth. Its peoples. That's what they represent. The clusters of the vine of the earth represent its peoples. Who worship the image of the beast. Who go along with this godless antichrist world. Who reject the rule of Christ. People who are not qualified to have been taken in the wheat harvest. Why are they not qualified? Because they're not justified by Christ's atonement by his death, by his shed blood. They still bear their own sin and rebellion and they bear full responsibility for it themselves. And in that respect, when the elect have been taken out of the world, they're beyond the reach of mercy. They rejected Christ in life and now he leaves them to his angels to reap. It isn't Christ that reaps these. He leaves them to the angels to reap. Christ has already reaped his own people out of the world. And instead of eternal rest and glory, which is the lot of those who are the people of God, the rest are cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Now many try to speculate about what this could mean in vivid detail. And I'm not going to do that. 
because I think as history rolls on, the manifestations are just changing so quickly, we cannot say it's absolutely this or absolutely that. But this much is clear. When God's people have been taken out of the way, the final destruction of life on this earth will be unleashed. Do you remember, those of you that were alive in the 1970s and 80s, how we feared nuclear annihilation in the Cold War, didn't we? we everybody was absolutely... There were documentaries on television as to how dreadful it would be if there was a, a nuclear war and, and how hardly anybody would survive because there were so many nuclear weapons. It would just wipe everything out. It was such a vivid, real possibility. Don't go saying that Revelation is, is speculating beyond the realms of reality. It, in 1980s, everybody was terrified of nuclear annihilation in the Cold War. And today, it's not that, though the possibility is still there, there's still enough nuclear weapons, but now we fear Islamic Jihad. That's the great fear of our day. And of being overrun, and of our society, and of our culture, and of our values, being completely overrun. You know, you have to, it's in the news every day. Isn't it? There was a, there was a the, the lorry driver's boss or, or, or confederation boss was on the radio news this morning talking about how dire it is in Calais at the moment with the hordes of migrants and the, the threats of life to the truck drivers and how they're almost at, at the point of saying we can no longer go through that port because it's such a threat to, to safety and to our lives. You know, and, and it's the, the vision we saw of the angels being taken out of the river Euphrates and the great hordes coming across those borders it, it so much fits with it but whatever the result it's the same end whatever the detail is it's the same end verse 20 it's a river of blood and it's 1600 furlongs long and it's up to the horse bridles in depth now it's picture language it's picture language but nevertheless it's a stark picture isn't it that what comes out of this wine press What's 1,600 furlongs got to do with it? 1,600 is 40 times 40. Yeah? That's 1,600. 40 is 4 times 10. What's 4 the number of? 4 is the number of the world of people. You know, we talk about the four corners of the world. It's used again and again in Revelation. 10? You know, like seven is the number of divine perfection and completion. Ten is the number of earthly, worldly, created completeness. It's all of them. Four times ten times four times ten. All of them. It means all of them. With no escape. And we read elsewhere of frantic efforts to escape. Pleading with the mountains to fall on us that we might escape from this. No, it means every one of them. God will repay what his justice demands. I told you earlier on, the purpose of this book, one of its purposes, is to give a clear warning. Will you heed the clear warning? Will you cry out with the Philippian jailer? Because he came to this realisation of judgment that was certain, and he was the wrong side of, of being right with God. What must I do to be saved? And what did Paul and Silas reply? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You and anybody else in your family that believes. Believing in itself doesn't save. But it demonstrates this. If you believe it demonstrates your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. It demonstrates that Christ did take your sin at Calvary and pay the price of justice. It demonstrates this, that you are sanctified, set apart by the Spirit of God and belief of the truth. It demonstrates this, you are qualified to be taken in the wheat harvest. Do you know, it's, it's hard preaching on passages like this, but we cannot avoid it, because God has given it to us. It's very, very clear. Eternal blessings for his people who are justified by Christ who have faith in him, who trust him, and follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And absolutely dreadful judgment for the rest, who will not bow, who will not acknowledge him, who will not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who will go into eternity bearing their own sins. And God's law, God's justice, by the very nature of God, must give it that retribution to which it is due and it deserves.